and welcome to FAU's Research in Action. My name is Karen Scapinato, and I work in the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. Welcome to our weekly Research in Action series. Before we get started, I want to go over some logistics. Uh, because of the number of attendees that we have, uh, we don't allow verbal questions. However, we would like to take your questions. If you hover your mouse at the uh, bottom of your screen uh, in the window, you see a Q&A button there. If you push that button, you can type your questions in the uh, little window that pops up. Um, so you can type your questions at any given time. It doesn't have to be at the end. Uh, we will go through the presentation first and then take your questions. Uh, we will try and um, take as many questions during the, uh, the hour that we have. If we don't make it through all of the uh, questions uh, during this hour, we will collect those questions and answer them and put them up on our website. The same is true for the presentation. There will be a recording of this presentation uh, put up shortly after we finish uh, today's session. Probably a day or two later, you will see it on our Research in Action site on our website for the uh, Division of Research at FAU. With that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. His name is Dr. Colin Polsky, and he's the director of the Center for Environmental Studies at uh, Florida Atlantic University. And while you may think that Dr. Polsky has a, uh, an extensive background in environmental sciences, which is certainly true, and he's a geographer, he also has a very impressive background in other disciplines, which include mathematics, humanities, French, geography and science and international affairs, a very eclectic uh, collection of, of uh, background and, and uh, topics that he is well, well versed in. Dr. Polsky has published extensively and uh, has also received federal funding for his research, uh, particularly in the areas of human dimensions of global environmental changes. With that, I'm gonna take it over to him to tell you about his research. Greetings, everybody. My name is Colin Polsky, as Dr. Scarpinato said, and I work at Atlantic University here in South Florida. And it's a pleasure to share with you some of these ideas that uh, we at the Center for Environmental Studies, as well as our collaborators here in Florida, as well as elsewhere, have been putting together in recent years. Uh, as Dr. Scarpinato said, or was alluding to, I do have a very eclectic background. It means uh, the, the job title I, I have is really a climate social scientist. That job title or job description or, or sub-discipline name didn't really exist 20 or 30 years ago. So it's a relatively new field and it's certainly one that's taken off. And as the uh, climate has been changing, uh, worldwide and as researchers have been organizing into trying to develop new perspectives on this challenge. So today what I hope to share with you is, uh, as I've been titled the presentation, Transforming a Wetter Florida into a Better Florida. So it's uh, notably and intentionally a uh, positive and optimistic spin on what is a uh, pretty big threat and pretty big challenge for us here in Florida, as well as in many other places worldwide, namely sea level rise stemming from climate change. Now, we are getting wetter, so the ocean levels are rising, and for low elevation locations such as where we live, that's a big challenge. It's not a good thing, as you can see by the photograph in the right there, to have water in the streets. It's disruptive, it's dangerous, the water is dirty. Now luckily the water is not there as you see illustrated in the photo every day, not yet. What we know is coming is more days like what you see in that photograph there, which was taken a couple of Octobers ago during a very sunny day. So the ocean is forcing its way into the streets through the storm drains. Um, we expect more of that. And, and so the question is, well, do we just sit back and take it or do we actually try and grab the problem 
right now such that tomorrow will be an even better Florida. So again, we are getting wetter. How might we become better? So the outline of the presentation is, as you see there on the left, basically uh, South Florida's role in this, this leading role in this global story. And number two is the role of journalism and other media and uh, crafting or shaping the message that you have, may have heard already and that I wish to elaborate on and expand. And then number three is thinking about how we can translate the data and maps that I will show you and that you may have seen in newspaper stories or the like into experiences and therefore action. What I'd like to do first though is just take a moment since I have a few extra minutes here. Um, slides not advancing. There. Um, hopefully you can see in the lower left, what we have is a screenshot from a news story a few years ago by the local NPR radio station. And the title of this story is The Battle Against Brain Drain in South Florida. And so what I want to do is just take a brief moment to speak to why this issue is so important in, in the role for universities. So the mission of the university is, is, is centered around knowledge. Uh, three actions related to knowledge. Number one, teaching our undergraduate and graduate students. Number two, doing research. So sitting on the cutting edge and trying to answer outstanding questions. And number three, community engagement. And that is sharing our information and learning from different constituencies outside of the university. Uh, what we can share and learn together to take action in ways that are mutually beneficial. To do that latter hope there to, to, to advance on important problems, it helps to have a talented and well-trained workforce. And that is, uh, speaks to our teaching mission to, to train our youth to take uh, the best jobs available. And the reason I'm highlighting this here is because the challenge that we face and the goal that we aspire to in this area of climate change adaptation often goes by the name of resilience. And resilience is a broad uh, umbrella term for a growing, rapidly growing industry of people that um, are, have training in civil engineering or architecture or construction or policy or even business in the humanities. There are many different jobs emerging in the resilience field and interestingly enough, South Florida is arguably one of the biggest hubs for resilience thinking and resilience employment in, I would say, the United States, perhaps even the world. And so that is one of our goals at Florida Atlantic University is to educate our young students such that they can take advantage of not only traditional industries, but also emerging new industries such as climate resilience. And so before I get into the meat of the presentation, one other setting the table note, and that is the question of politics. Partisan politics is very much uh, a dimension of climate change discussions, whether it's about the existence or what do we do about it. That is absolutely not what I am going to be presenting today. Politics in the general sense of the term is something we can discuss. It's very relevant, it's important, it's interesting, but the partisan angle is definitely not what you will find here. So let's dive right into it. And I will sh begin with a map from NASA. And this is, as they say, a picture tells a thousand stories. And we won't tell all thousand stories here, but let me introduce this image to you and share with you what it means. So this is a composite satellite image of changes in ocean levels uh, over the period about 20 years uh, from January 93 to January 2016. And the different colors in the different parts of the ocean that you see correspond, as you see uh, in the legend at the bottom to the rates of change uh, annualized over this 
time period. Now, 2016 as the endpoint means that this picture is a little bit out of date, but not too much. And what's amazing here, first of all, is that we even have the technology to measure ocean levels at the precision of millimeters, uh, which we do. And that is just something to uh, be grateful for. Uh, but what we see in terms of the outcome of this image is basically there's colors that correspond to all parts of the spectrum in the legend, all the way from the blues, that is to say sea level uh, declines, uh, all the way to the reds, which are sea level increases. But really on balance, what you see, the takeaway message is there's a whole lot more red and orange and yellow in this picture than there is blue. And so that means that on balance for the planet, even though at any given location, you might find compared to some other location, a different rate of change, uh, on balance, we have sea level rise in the positive sense uh, over this time period. The number actually, if you are interested, averaging or summing across all of these uh, different pixels, these different uh, image, pieces of the image is 3.2 millimeters per year. So 3.2 millimeters per year is the global average change. That's a positive value, so it's a rise. Uh, over the time period they're specified at the top of the screen. So this is indeed a global challenge. Here I'm showing a map that comes from National Geographic and I will um, highlight for you the main takeaway for it, uh, from it, even if you can't read it in all of its detail. Uh, basically it's highlighting the cities, the top five cities around the world in green that ranked by the exposed assets, the economic value of the assets that are in harm's way, that is to say at low elevation uh, from sea level rise. Uh, Miami is number one, that's the bottom line. And by Miami here, they mean basically the metropolitan area from West Palm Beach in the north down to Key West in the south, including Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton and Miami itself uh, in between. Uh, Miami has a greater exposed asset tally than even New York City. Uh, New York is number three in the list. Uh, the other uh, cities are Guangzhou, China, Kolkata in India, and Shanghai, also in China. Now, the other five cities in red are the top cities in the world ranked by exposed population. So Miami doesn't rank in the top five there because we have only six or six and a half approaching seven million people. So that's a lot of people, but it's nothing compared to Calcutta or Mumbai or Dhaka, double digit numbers of millions of people. So you can slice and dice the data in different ways in terms of trying to understand the uh, extent of the challenge, where we see it greatest and in what terms but um, Miami is number one, at least in terms of exposed assets. So that helps to bolster my case for at least the need for the resilience industry to have a very strong footing here in South Florida as in fact it does. Now let's uh, zoom in from the global picture to the United States. And here we see a list of the top 25 cities in America this is from 2017 from a think tank called Climate Central. Uh, so this list is a little bit out of date, but it's not really that old. I don't think the list would change much if we used 2020 data, even if we had 2020 data. Now, if you were to inspect this list, at this point, usually I take a pause and ask the audience to comment, what can you take away from this list? Um, here in this virtual setting, I can't see all of you sitting around in your pajamas on Zoom. Um, so I can't really do that, but I'll just tell you the punchline. Of the top 25 cities in America, here we're ranking by population. Uh, that is to say the uh, people living within FEMA's 100 year flood plain. 
Uh, 22 of the top 25 are in Florida. So this global picture that I was painting in the two previous slides has a very strong Florida feel to it. Now, that's not to say that the challenge is not present elsewhere in the country or in the world, but the concentration of exposed people and assets in Florida is truly uh, world-class, world-leading. Now, let's zoom in geographically a little more from the global to the national, and then Florida to the South Florida perspective. Of the top 25 cities here, 12 are in Broward County. And uh, the other 10 that are in Florida, most of them are in Miami-Dade County. So the Florida picture, yes, there are locations in Florida, Tampa, St. Petersburg, for example, that uh, are also experiencing or exposed to this challenge. But the dominant flavor here of the places that are exposed in terms of the number of people at least and the assets is largely concentrated in Broward and Miami-Dade counties. Monroe County with the Keys as well uh, is massively exposed and at significant risk. They don't make this particular list because the uh, permanent populations in those cities is not big enough, but they are at significant risk. Palm Beach County, part of our metropolitan area, is definitely exposed, but uh, they have a bit higher of an elevation than we do to the south, which explains why there aren't too many Palm Beach cities in the top ranking. So what is the role of journalism and the media in telling this story? So that is a good story that I've started to outline. And the media, of course, have picked up on it. And it's been very present, uh, very prominently, uh, very consistently for the last uh, five to seven years. Very popular books have come out. Um, and then here, just as one illustration in Scientific American, the headline, from 2016, but the stories just keep coming. Really, they're quite similar. Uh, seas rising, but Florida keeps building on the coast. So those of us who live here in South Florida know, especially in the last uh, five, 10 years, that there's been a continued building boom. Of course, now with the economy taking a big hit from the coronavirus, the development may halt for a little bit, but there are lots of cranes out there driving up and down in Broward and Miami-Dade counties, Palm Beach County in particular. So why on earth are these Floridians continuing to build? Because everybody knows the oceans are rising and surely that's going to put these new assets. Why would you invest new assets in such a location? Well, that's an interesting framing and it's it has some kind of natural answers from the developer's perspective and from consumer's perspective, but it does present a, a real challenge. And so the problem though, is that these media stories have been multiplying and multiplying and multiplying where they are present, do they, they basically stop at presenting the challenge. What they don't do is present how we experience sea level rise and more specifically how we are in the resilience field already acting and animating to address the challenge. So I'm not saying that all of the problems have been solved. I'm simply saying that there has been a massive effort launched here in coordination with experts around the world to tackle this problem. And so there's that also is a good story and that is not really getting reported. So that is part of my goal is to share some of those uh, developments or at least get you to the point where we can then have conversations about the resilience initiatives underway. So I wanna just show a few more uh, photos drilling down from the, the, the global to the national, to the state, to the regional and down to the kind of individual lived experience. Um, perspective. And so here, this is what sea level rise uh, is often experienced as. So this young woman's trying to walk 
to school. Uh, she has water, again, dirty water, um, almost up to her knees, and she's very distressed. Um, but at least, you know, she, we can probably guess, is going to make it successfully to her uh, destination. By contrast, if you were in a wheelchair or otherwise maybe not as able to get around as she is, um, it might not be so simple. You might be confined in your home um, despite the weather being very good. It's not raining outside. Uh, it's nonetheless impassable. Um, even this young woman, you know, she's walking, you can't really see the ground so well. And so you might trip and uh, twist your ankle. You know, all of these relatively minor sounding challenges are accumulate set into uh, really a big deal. Um, I'll further flesh out these types of lived experiences and the ways in which sea level rise really is sometimes in the news it gets called a nuisance. These are nuisance flooding events. Um, really it's much more than a nuisance when you think about it. So in the top right we have a photo of some from the Miami Herald of some tourists arriving from Iowa to a Miami Beach hotel. And I don't know if you can tell, but they're walking to the hotel entrance through four to six inches of water in the streets. And so sometimes I joke, gotta have a sense of humor about this sometimes, that perhaps we should change the tourism motto to come to Miami where the ocean meets you at your taxi. After a while, that's probably gonna get old. And so tourism is one of our major industries and this is not the experience we want our tourists to have. In the lower left, we have a picture from a couple of Octobers ago in Hollywood, a pretty big city here in Broward County of a very nice uh, home under construction. And this is, if you think about it and look closely, a, an ex illustration of the resilience efforts underway. So the city of Hollywood has put in some new building codes that says new building, uh, new residential buildings need to uh, be elevated to a certain uh, new minimum elevation uh, above a benchmark because of the sea level rise that we know is coming. And this photo was taken um, a few, uh, as I say, Octobers ago, and there you see with the person walking through the street, uh, the water is a few inches high. Again, it's not a uh, Noah's Ark-like flood, but this is uh, now a canal. The street is a canal. Interestingly, if you think about this adaptation, it starts of building codes requiring homes to be higher new builds than the uh, prior, uh, prior codes, um, it starts to paint a picture of the interconnectedness of this challenge and of our society because the water that flows off of the uh, landscaping, elevated home and its landscaping that we see there is going to go to lower locations, namely the neighbor's yards. And so while for the, it makes sense to require that new build uh, homes be elevated, that doesn't necessarily mean that the problem has gotten better for the neighbors. In fact, the problem may have gotten worse. So this is beginning to paint a picture of the challenges that we face, not as individuals, but as a society. In the lower right, we see a photograph again, of another beautiful uh, fall day, but water is in the streets and in particular, a uh, high income neighborhood in Fort Lauderdale with two homes being uh, marketed for sale across the street from one another. And I don't know if you can tell, but the water is in the street a few inches high. It doesn't go the entire length of the street, but it goes to the yards of these homes for sale and so real estate is another of our big industries down here. And if you are a realtor trying to market a home, uh, 
it's not the best, I would imagine, if you have to tell your clients to bring galoshes to make it to view the home's interior. Um, so whether it's real estate sales or, or construction and home values or tourism or just getting to work, uh, sea level rise, again, it's not a Noah's Ark biblical type of flood event necessarily. Often it's much more low key but it clearly is a nuisance minimally, um, if not a major disruption to our economy. Um, so it bears studying and thinking through how to respond. So let me just show a couple of quick images about the data to give you a sense of the scale of the challenge. Um, this is the sea level as measured by NOAA's tide gauge in Key West. And interestingly, the Key West uh, tide record is among the longest in the entire United States. And uh, it's, it's about a century long. And that's great for science because the longer time period over which you have observations, the more confidently you can draw conclusions about the trends that you see in your data. And so kind of like the stock market goes up, goes down, you know, in any given year, there still is a trend. Uh, in this case, it's up. And if you fit a best fit curve or a line, a linear best fit uh, regression here, in the blue dotted line, we see the um, average trend over this time period. And it turns out that it's about 10 inches over the last century which is about two and a half millimeters per year. Now you may remember from the satellite image from NASA that I showed, the more recent time period of 93 to 2016, the global average was 3.2 millimeters per year. This is about 2.5. It makes sense given what we know from basic climate change research that the rate of change may be increasing. And so the long-term record here of 2.5 millimeters is, as we would expect, a little lower than the more recent 3.2 global average that we saw from the satellite image. Now, there's another, a whole bunch of other tide gauges around the United States, and one of them is in Virginia Key, which is in Miami. And that time, that record only goes back to 1992, and I've put that uh, time, that time series here in black over the blue record for Key West. And as you can see, the black line for Virginia Key mirrors very closely the blue line for Key West. And that is as we would expect because the two locations are not very far apart. There are tiny deviations, but basically they're very similar. What is noteworthy is that if you fit the best fit line to the Virginia Key record, again, it only goes back to 1992. As you see there, hopefully in the black dotted line, the, the, the slope of the line is steeper, which means it is uh, a greater rate of change. So instead of two and a half millimeters per year for the full century for Key West, the rate of change for Virginia Key is closer to five millimeters per year over this time period. So there again, we see the rate of change itself increasing. And in physics, we call that an acceleration. So the rate of change from two or two and a half millimeters per year to three, 3.2, now maybe five, um, at least locally, is suggestive of something that we have thought for a long time, and that is that the rate of change would be increasing. So let me further illustrate that. You might say, okay, so that's the historical record. What then does the future look like? And of course, nobody has a crystal ball, but it, one natural thing to do is to simply extend the linear trends that you have for the historical data and just extend them into the future. And so that's what we have here. The black dotted line is extended just straight into the future and the blue dotted line is just straight extended as well. Now, just to take a, a single year in the future as a, 
as, a, as an illustration to discuss, I put a red dot there at the year 2060. And so the more uh, recent trend uh, that we see for Virginia Key or for Key West, if you look over the same time period, is the black line. And if we follow this linear trend to 2060, which is, you know, if it's 2020 now, if you were to buy a home now, usually it's a 30 year mortgage. So that gets you to 2050. So 2060, just for the sake of argument, is more or less within the time frame of, of a new mortgage that somebody might be considering to buy now. Well, how many inches of sea level rise would that get us if we followed this linear trend that we're currently observing here in South Florida? The answer is, if you look at the red dot, go over to the y-axis, about 12 inches. About 12 inches or another seven or so inches compared to what we currently have, but 12 inches compared to 1992 level. The problem is we're not in a linear world, as I've already alluded to a few times. So again, with the rate of change is itself increasing, if the increase is increasing, then we're not in a linear world, but we're in a nonlinear world where we would expect to see curved future trends of sea levels. And so these curves are four scenarios um, selected by uh, regional scientists and policymakers from the 2015 set of projections from a fantastic group here called the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. Now, this is their old set of curves. In, in December, they released a new set of curves, which uh, are updated. Uh, the general story is the same. I will update my slides soon. But basically, the, the red dot at the bottom is the red dot that we had from the previous slide, just for a point of comparison. So if we were to stay in a linear world of sea level change, sea level rise, that we would be in 2060 at that red dot of 12 inches over 1992 levels, as I described already. But if we take the nonlinear world that we're pretty sure is coming, then we may end up, if we uh, happen to follow the curve, the, the orange curve, at uh, upwards of 35 inches of sea level rise instead of just 12. So that's what happens when you're in a nonlinear situation is that the changes rapidly accumulate. So let's talk about these changes somewhere on the order of 10, you know, a foot to three feet or even more. You know, kind of so what? Well, let's translate our perspective from kind of time graphs with lines and curves to maps and ask the question, well, where might it flood due to tides? This is called tidal flooding. Um, there are other kinds of flood risk associated with sea level rise in the future. And, and so we can begin to visualize not just the future in terms of the aggregate sea level that we might expect at a tide gauge location, but to then project and uh, illustrate where, which neighborhoods might expect to be wet in the future scenarios. Um, this map is a zoom in of some of metropolitan Fort Lauderdale. And it simply shows, and it's in, uh, incidentally, it's created by the University of Florida Geoplan group. Uh, and you can go online and create your own map of your own location as you like under the scenarios that you choose. But under the scenario that I chose for, in this case, the year 2080, they didn't have 2060, I don't think. But nonetheless, it's a handful of decades into the future is the locations in blue here um, are where in a part of Fort Lauderdale, we expect a significant amount of water in the streets, a significant number of days per year. Uh, that's, again, hearkening back to some of the photographs I showed, a picture of substantial disruption, uh, substantial nuisance, substantial changes in our economy and in our daily lives. Um, the number of days per year, as I alluded to uh, in that slide, I just generically referenced a significant number of days. Um, we get two tides a day, two high tides, two low tides. And so that means that if there are 365 days in a year, there's 
730 potential uh, flooding from high tide events per year. Now, the number of days per year where we would expect in the future, in this case from a report by NOAA and the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, in the year 2045, so a little bit closer into the future, um, varies from one location to the next. And so here we have seven or eight Florida locations with in uh, the light blue bars, the number of events per year um, currently, excuse me, that's in the dark blue, and those bars are very tiny. So in many locations around Florida today, there's not a lot of tidal flooding from sea level rise today experienced in the streets as we speak. Definitely in places like Fort Lauderdale and in the Keys and in Miami Beach and elsewhere in Broward and Miami-Dade counties, we see this regularly, especially in the fall, and it's, it's a big deal. But um, in other places, we don't yet observe it too much. Now, by contrast, in the light blue bars, we see the number of events per year uh, for a variety of locations, including Virginia Key, which is almost uh, every day, uh, it's more than every day, actually, uh, more than once per day, uh, flooding from tides. And that's a big deal. Not so much by comparison in St. Petersburg, but there are a handful of locations that aren't shown on this graph where we know the future nuisance flooding events per year um, will be very significant um, elsewhere in our region. Uh, but this is just a collection of locations selected from a particular study that correspond to tide gauge location. So there is a real concern here. And now I want to return to the question of, well, okay, what are we gonna do about it? What could we do about it? What are we doing about it? How might we, we are becoming wetter, how might we become better? Here are a couple of renderings by a colleague of mine at Florida Atlantic University, an architecture professor named Jeff Huber, who's a leading, uh, who's a major thought leader in this area. And as well as with other colleagues here, thinking through, well, the water's coming, so how might we respond with the built environment, with our design, with our uh, zoning, and so one way is to accommodate the water. So here we have a rendering that uh, allows us to see how we could have residential and commercial uh, use of the land while also allowing the water to come because it's coming and allowing for wildlife to reclaim some of the area and for recreation, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards and the like. Another way to think about this in terms of what we could do and not really in what I would call rocket science, it's part of what's been understood from urban design and urban meteorology for a long time. And that is the more impervious surfaces you have compared to vegetation, the hotter and less absorbent of the water your landscape will be. So here again from Professor Huber, we have a photograph of a typical lands urban landscape here in the region, 60 feet of right of way, basically 100% uh, asphalt, uh, very little in the way of vegetation, and definitely a hot spot for heat as well as uh, runoff. By contrast, you could have the same landscape with the same population density but that looks much different in terms of its vegetation and that would therefore be cooler with lower heating or rather cooling costs. It would make it more pleasant to walk around outside. And of course, there'd be a greater absorption capacity uh, of the land for the water as well as an evapotranspiration potential that's much greater with vegetation than without vegetation. So getting the water away naturally, as well as cooling the area, this is the type of thing that we can do. It's been done before 
and it's something on the docket. So with that as just a couple of illustrations, I wish to close and to repeat that we are becoming wetter. Many locations in Florida, many locations around the world are also becoming wetter. Florida, South Florida in particular, is uh, a particularly exposed region. And we also have a lot of action underway in the field of resilience. That is to say how we can respond to thrive and prosper through adversity. With that, I'd like to say thank you and I appreciate your attending this webinar. Great. Thank you, uh, Colin. It was very informative. Um, before we start with our question and answers, if you uh, would like to ask a question, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button there and you can type your questions there. With that, um, Colin, thanks again. Um, you mentioned that the water is coming and we had a couple of questions related to okay, does that just mean that our streets will get flooded or will we see whole buildings underwater to the point that uh, this might look like uh, Venice, Italy, for example? Well, it's a gradual progression in terms of the magnitude of the water in the streets. That is to say, what we're seeing now in some of the photos that I showed is what we should expect to continue to see in the immediate future, which is to say uh, water in the streets, two, six, 12, maybe 20 inches in some places. Um, so it won't quite reach the uh, interior of many buildings. But one of the reasons Miami, Metro Miami ranks number one in the world for exposed assets is that, and I didn't speak to this, um, the, our whole region is very low lying. It's very flat and it's a very, very low elevation. And so many homes and, and businesses are at elevations uh, below 10 feet above sea level. So uh, those that are closer to two feet above sea level, for example, or one foot or three feet, they do risk having water intrude into their structures in the near future. And somewhat related to that question, um, based on your sea level I means chart and the trend, will Florida, Florida simply be submerged in water and like say 2016, it's unrepairable at that point? Well, again, so much of our region is at such low elevation that if we see sea level rises of the order of five to six or 10 feet, which is the case for certain scenarios. Again, no one has a perfect crystal ball to know exactly what the future will bring. But if we see sea level rise on the order of double digit numbers of feet, then yes, that will inundate most of our region. So would you recommend Florida residents to just move to a different state? <laughs> I, I have uh, set down roots here. I'm uh, betting on South Florida. What we need to think about, and again, the, the projections could come in at under, or rather the, the actual sea level rise, this century could come in at lower than double digit numbers of feet, in which case there'll be fewer neighborhoods wet um, but what we need to recognize is that if we start thinking about this problem now, as has, has begun, um, we can uh, begin to accommodate and anticipate and reorganize our landscapes in a way that, no, I don't think requires us to move. In fact, I titled the presentation, Transforming a Wetter Florida into a Better Florida because I think that if we do this transformation of our landscape uh, in the places that make sense to do it, then we'll actually become a place that's even more attractive. Thank you. I believe uh, people right now primarily see these types of floods that you should in your, your um, slides during hurricane season or something that's associated with a hurricane. So one of the questions that were submitted uh, is, are these floods normally uh, just during the fall or in the hurricane season, or are there potential? Is there a potential for floods during other seasons? 
really for the 21st century, we should just think about this as a fall phenomenon. So maybe a little bit in August, some years, but certainly much more common in September and really October and November, uh, maybe a little in December. So it's basically a fall phenomenon. And in that period spans really the end of hurricane season to the beginning of, of the, the dry season. So it's, it's a little bit of an overlap with hurricane season. Okay. Completely different questions, more related to your own interest in sea level rise. What makes you passionate about that topic? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So academics um, go into academia because they like interesting, vexing, challenging questions. And I don't think there's any, more, any topic more interesting and uh, topical and challenging and important uh, than this topic. It's something that uh, struck me, as, again, as a climate social scientist, as a way to uh, think through the biophysical domain, so climate, uh, what human activities are doing to contribute to changing climate, as well as how people perceive the associated impacts and how we respond. So it, it's really tailor-made, uh, just my particular uh, quirky set of interests, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, coming back to the effects of flooding, um, one of the questions that was posted, will the rising seas harm wildlife and the Everglades in particular? Well, that's a great question. So one of geographers' uh, common mantras is everything is related to everything else. And that um, adage applies here in South Florida to the sea level rise context uh, as much as any other context. So number one is we have what's called a karst, a limestone uh, geology, which means uh, water from the ocean uh, and from the surface gets communicated back and forth through the ground, the underground, uh, the subsurface. And that means that the Everglades is connected uh, to our Gulf as well as to our Atlantic environments. Number two is that the Everglades is very low elevation. In fact, in some, perhaps most of the Everglades is at a lower elevation than uh, our coastal cities here in Southeast Florida. So that in fact, water is flowing downhill as you go west from Interstate 95 uh, for big parts of our region. So the short answer is yes, what happens in the coastal zone affects what happens in the Everglades and vice versa. Um, there's also the independent development that Everglades water management is um, attempting to, for the purposes of restoring the ecosystem there, send water to the Everglades from the north, from central Florida. And so we have faced the prospect of the Everglades uh, groundwater, at least, becoming uh, higher and saltier from sea level rise at the same time as we see greater delivery of fresh water at the surface from the north. And so the effects on the wildlife there, uh, there will be effects on the wildlife. For one reason, uh, the salinity matters for the wildlife that's currently there. They're accustomed to a freshwater environment. And number two is the wildlife there is also accustomed to a certain depth. Now, wildlife like humans can adapt uh, within certain ranges. So there's been some research at, uh, particularly in the uh, biology and geosciences departments at FAU, as well as at other, uh, many other universities looking at the questions of how wildlife may be able to or not adapt to the changing quantity and quality of water in the Everglades. And I can point people to some of those papers if they're interested. Great, thank you. Um, related to fresh water, you mentioned the effect of the sal salinity on the wildlife, but uh, excuse me, will the sea level rise harm our, uh, our own fresh water supply? Well, that's another great question. And the short answer is there's definitely a risk. There's also good news, the uh, authorities in charge of freshwater delivery and management at both the uh, 
district as well as county and municipal at, at all levels uh, recognize this challenge and are monitoring it and uh, trying to um, anticipate their management accordingly. So there is uh, one of the things being monitored is the um, saltwater uh, boundary. That is how far inland in the groundwater do we see uh, saltwater. And we expect that if we don't do anything, that that saltwater line will extend further and further west. And that's important because one of South Florida's assets for its development is the really abundant and high quality drinking water we get from below in the aquifers, below the surface. If that, those aquifers become saline, then it's not so readily usable, then water becomes more expensive, much more expensive to deliver to our households and our businesses. So at least um, so far in uh, Broward and Miami-Dade counties, uh, to my knowledge, the extent of what we call saltwater intrusion into the aquifers has been um, observed, but it's been limited, uh, thankfully less uh, present than was originally um, feared. That doesn't mean that the challenge uh, has evaporated and doesn't require uh, continued monitoring and um, planning. And so, but rest assured, the counties, for example, are uh, in the Water management districts are actively involved in that. Great. Uh, we have several questions related to building and building structure. Is there anything that we should and need to change in terms of how we build? Like, for, for example, one question here is, should we build ho uh, boat homes, for example, or homes built on the water? Are there any recommendations on that end? So I'm a climate social scientist. I'm not a, a builder or an architect or a, a designer, but I collaborate with uh, people in those fields and, and as well as uh, developers in the private sector. And, and the short answer is there's a handful of things that I, again, I wouldn't call rocket science that we should be thinking to do for structures that are uh, currently uh, in harm's way or that in locations that where structures might be built. And again, you know, just elevating the home is one thing. Um, a little bit more complicated perhaps is the question of the foundation structure, uh, the connection between the home and the ground. Maybe the materials need to be more salt uh, tolerant than they currently are. And the same would apply to some of the below ground uh, stormwater, for example, infrastructure and sewer infrastructure, we want that stuff to be able to not disintegrate in the face of uh, salt water. Um, so can that be done? Uh, without a doubt. And some of the technologies for these types of interventions are present and some are maybe not quite available, but again, not like, it's not like a moonshot. Um, those would be some of the things one might do. Um, again, relatively simple, putting fewer things that are valuable at the ground level of our structures seems like a good idea. Your electrical uh, box, for instance, your um, living uh, quarters maybe need to be elevated. Uh, these are kind of uh, natural things I think folks might want to think about for this Great. Um, we're kind of running out of time. We have a lot more questions. So what we will be doing with those questions are we collect them, we have Dr. Polsky answer them, and we will have a question and answer uh, side on our website. So if you look for research in action, you will see your answers there. Uh, Dr. Polsky, if you can uh, answer a last question. There were quite a few questions of what can the individual do? You mentioned landscaping, for example, but are there like three things or so that the individual can do to assist and mitigate the sea level uh, and the water rise? Well, that's a great question. So in part for where the answer will depend on where you live, how, what is the elevation of your home or your business? And the answer for most of us living down here is very low. But um, 
12 inches, every 12 inches makes a difference. And so if you happen to be already at eight feet above sea level, individually on your property, you may not need to do as much as somebody who's currently at one or two or three feet above sea level. And in those cases, uh, the lower lying uh, properties, again, there's, there's landscaping, what we call green infrastructure, again, uh, relying on vegetation uh, or uh, biological communities to help uh, with this challenge. Uh, those are options. You can look on, you can Google green infrastructure, for example, and start to get a, a menu of things you might do. But that's at the individual level. I might also suggest that uh, collectively we, and this is the reason I'm here today and so happy for this opportunity is to, to share the word and to help raise awareness uh, so that our elected officials can have uh, support of their constituents for looking into this challenge to help prepare us. And so in Broward County, for example, there's an entire division uh, called the Resilience Environmental Planning Resilience Division um, or something to that effect. It has a long name, but the point is there's a world-class staff of scientists and policy uh, makers at Broward County because the elected officials have uh, supported, been aware of this issue and supported it. And so to the extent that individually we can lend our uh, moral support for continuing to uh, have such staff, both in local government as well as in the private sector, I think then we'll collectively be in a position to uh, respond to this challenge. Great, thank you very much. Thanks again, uh, Colin, for speaking today. As I mentioned, the recording of the presentation as well as the question and answers will be posted on our website shortly. Uh, next week, we have a presentation on substance use, so we hope that you can all join us. Thanks again. Have a good day.